What's up, YouTube? So we're carrying on with our episodes on mixing electronic music and more particularly on EQs. And I mentioned in a previous episode a little bit about pre and post EQ. And I figured it'd be great to kind of round up these EQ episodes with a little bit of insight into pre and post EQ, why it's important, things to look out for and all sorts of stuff like that. So let's dive in and have a look. So I'm not going to get too much into dynamics processing and compression and stuff like that in this episode. I'm saving that for the next set of episodes. But um, for the purpose of this tutorial, I'm going to use uh, compression and limiting to kind of outline a few things for you guys. And specifically to show you why pre-EQ is quite an important thing. I've been getting quite a few questions uh, in my videos about, you know, pre-post-EQ, why I use EQ and certain places on the effect track and stuff like that. So I wanted to kind of outline a few things for you guys. So for the purpose of this tutorial, um, we've kind of been going through mixing this track uh, slowly but surely. Um, I've taken this kick that we've got and I want to show you guys something using this kick as an example. So put some EQ onto this kick to kind of outline a couple of things for you guys. And this is kind of more the corrective style of EQ. Um, the kind of first two steps that I outlined in the EQ series and you know, removing lows from the kick and stuff like that. And I'll show you guys why uh, removing these frequencies before using compression and limiting and dynamics processing and stuff like that can quite drastically change uh, the sound, you know, compared to using it after and stuff like that. So my whole kind of ethos between pre and post EQ is, uh, you know, any kind of like precisional fixing up of the sound, uh, removing lows, removing bad frequencies and that kind of thing. I like to do with pre-EQ and then placing the sound into the mix I like to use post-EQ and the cool thing about Cubase is you've actually got this uh, channel EQ that's kind of already uh, assigned as a post-EQ um, well essentially it's at this green line over here so what I like to do is I'll, I'll usually place uh, something like equilibrium first in the in the effects chain um, remove a couple of the kind of bad frequencies, the really sub frequencies and stuff like that. Um, and then I'll look at processing it further with dynamics and maybe some effects and stuff like that to place it into the mix. So for the purpose of this tutorial, I'm using uh, Flux Studio Sessions Pure Limiter. It came in the bundle that I uh, use with the analyzer and stuff like that. It's not essential to have this limiter. I just really like the way that it works and it's got a really helpful display over here. I believe uh, Fab Filters Pro L has a similar uh, display like this. This display helps to find the correct kind of like release times uh, as well as certain things like what I'm about to show you over here. So I'm just going to kind of set these to default. I want to turn the makeup off. Let's turn the re release to manual mode. And what I want to do is I want to show you what this kick sounds like, um, or at least what the sort of transient response of what's happening when we start to kind of like crush the dynamics using this threshold and have a look at, you know, how this limiter is reacting. And the idea is to kind of overdo it and then tame those kind of peaks and uh, those, those kind of like harsh transients and peaks that are kind of not supposed to be kicking through that hard using the pre-EQ. So it might be a bit confusing and it might not make sense. So I'm going to kind of do it to show you guys and kind of try talk through the process. So here's one thing to note is I've turned this threshold down to minus 12 dB and I generally like to mix my kicks in at around minus 12 dB or at least my kick and bass is peaking together at minus 12 dB. But that's actually what I've done in this track. But what's happening now is obviously it's catching that kind of very, very transient peak that the meter in Cubase might not be reading out. So... Obviously, it helps to have like a more advanced limiter or something to be able to pick up these little peaks and stuff like that. But also, this is why it's important to maybe like EQ some of the frequencies before running it through the limiter. So obviously, like I said, this is an extreme example. Um, so, you know, I'm sure you saw this kind of like animation, how it was really squashing that transient of the kick 
every time it hit. <coughs> and now when we turn the EQ on, you're going to notice that the sound sounds much better, even though it's being squashed. And it's not squashing those transient peaks as much. Check this out. Okay, so the example wasn't like quite extreme enough. So what I did is I've actually uh, just gained up this channel before uh, the limiter so that it can really squash the peak. So I can show you the huge difference between uh, pre-EQ and without a pre-EQ before, uh, before the dynamics processing. So uh, check this out. Um, I'm going to bypass this. And now notice how this is this limiter is absolutely squashing this kick beyond oblivion. And then when you turn this EQ back on again, it starts to sound much better and there's much less work happening in this limiter, which means there's much less kind of uh, of this, you know, unstable pumping motion happening in the dynamics of your track. So let's quickly reference. So like I said, this was a completely extreme example. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start um, toning it back a bit. You know, now that I've uh, picked up that this EQ is what I want to do with the track, um, I'm actually going to remove this kind of gain situation which I've added here. Um, and now we can start dialing back the amount of limiting or compression we're applying to this to this kick. You know, you don't have to compress or limit a kick. Um, I find it helps when you've got situations with rolls and stuff like that, where, you know, you've got these kind of, uh, you know, 16th or 64ths and stuff, which start to, start to kind of like build up and create like too much energy in a situation. Having a slight bit of limiting can make life a little bit easier when mixing the entire track. But I'm going to get a little bit more into dynamics processing and stuff in the next couple of episodes. So let's uh, start to dial this back a little bit. Um, just by reducing the threshold. So in situations where you've got like a little bit too much of a click coming through on a kick and you want to, you know, accentuate more bass, then uh, compression or limiting at least dynamics processing is a really good way of doing that. Because as you can see here with this little uh, graph readout, I was kind of truncating the little peak on each kick um, quite evenly. And another thing, another easy way to kind of pick this up is to again overdo it and then play with the release and then uh, sort of bring it back a little bit again. But like I said, I'm not going to dive too deep into dynamics and stuff in this episode. So I'm going to try uh, look at another couple of examples of pre-EQ and uh, compression limiting and stuff like that. And I think um, a percussion group might be a really good thing to do that on because it's got a lot of uh, wildly different uh, transient type of sounds and as well as lots of different frequency content. <clears throat> Okay, so we're heading towards this percussion group over here. Um, so I've had some EQ and stuff on the group to kind of remove a couple of harsh frequencies, but um, for the purpose of this tutorial, I'm gonna remove that EQ uh, by just placing these effects in different places in the chain. You can wildly uh, change the way that the sound is kind of being mixed in total, if that makes sense. 
So for example, um, uh, I'm actually just going to play this percussion uh, section quickly soloed and you're going to hear there's a very harsh mid-high sound coming through there. And that's kind of what I want to focus on to show you the power of this track. Okay, so let's slap on equilibrium over here. Um, I believe that kind of like really harsh frequency was around 4,000 hertz or so. Uh, we can actually punch in the exact number over here, 4078 that I had uh, for the example. And I dipped it down by about six and a half dB, about 1.7 Q. So there was another couple of, uh, there was another couple of things, uh, EQs that I had here. I had a bit of a high shelf um, that was going down a little bit from about 8K. Ugh, that should be fine. And then a bit of mid-range coming out. High pass or low cut at 250. So this should be back to how I kind of had it mixed in the track. So now if we put a compressor or limiter on here, essentially what we're doing is we're sending those harsh, loud frequencies along with the subtones and everything through to that compressor as well. And what's happening then is that really like uh, ringy transient peak is going to trigger the compressor as well. And it's going to trigger any of that kind of dynamics processing that's happening beyond that threshold. And we might not necessarily want that to happen. And I think that's why uh, the kind of like key thing about pre-EQ is changing the way that that threshold reacts in your dynamic processing effect. So <clears throat> again, I'm going to use pure limiter just because it's got that uh, display. But like I said, you can use lots of different examples here. It's almost like when you look at the graph, once you've kind of cleaned up these frequencies and stuff like that, particularly on something like a percussive element, you can almost see that rhythmic effect happening on these VUs. Whereas when there's these weird frequencies and stuff happening specifically with like resonant tones, it can be triggering these uh, dynamics processing differently at different times. Um, so that's also one thing to note is like kind of look out for that clean kind of like rhythmic effect happening uh, if you if you're using something like Pure Limiter or FabFilter Pro L or something like that. It's almost like you're using the limiter to accentuate the overall mix of these frequencies and it kind of like almost pinpoints those harsh frequencies much easier. So when you use a pre-EQ, almost this like, you know, ultra squashed, you know, completely destroyed dynamics loop that we've created doesn't sound too bad after all. I mean, obviously it's way overboard, but you know what I'm you know what I'm trying to get at. So the the limiter is a great tool to use to kind of squash those frequencies to check did you remove those kind of uh bad frequencies in the source sound. 
uh, it's great when using pre EQ because now we've kind of like you know set a kind of EQ that I know is going to work, and now I can start working on the dynamics. You know, I can move on to the next step. You know, it's not like you're juggling all of these different processes. You know, you can work through it systematically. So I kind of use this overdoing of the limiter technique to check if I've kind of accomplished what I wanted with the EQs, if that makes sense. So like I said, I'm overdoing it completely with this uh, limiter and I'm actually going to turn it off. <clears throat> and, you know, in relation, if we like solo the kick and bass and percussions and stuff, I feel like the kick is a little bit lacking in the mid range. So instead of then adding mid range to the pre EQ and then changing the way that our kind of dynamics have been, uh, we've kind of tweaked our dynamics, what we can use is these channel EQs to then boost a bit of mid range, if that makes sense. So this is just an example, like I said, I'm not actually gonna play it and AB them, um, just to show you guys uh, the kind of workflow that I use. Um, pre EQ is generally here on the channel and then the post EQ, I generally don't need to do all that much clinical stuff. It's generally just placing something in the mix, you know, maybe boosting or cutting some lows, highs, mids or something like that. So the channel EQ generally works for that. Awesome. I think that pretty much covers pre and post EQ. I hope you guys enjoyed that. If there's anything that I missed out, let me know in the comments and I'll try to cover it in a future episode. A big thanks to IDM Mag, proud supporters of the dance music scene and my channel. If you like what I do and you want to support me, head on over to my Patreon and check out the different pledges I've got there. As always, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. I'll see you guys next time.